yeah. my organic water bottle. Um, I am uh, here at the top of the agenda as the president's welcome. I know Emma is going to be watching from Italy. Hi, Emma. I'm not the president. Emma is still the president. I'm Jonathan Tour. I am one of the co-vice presidents of Gannett, for those of you who are not familiar with me. Um, I'm going to hand this right over to Susan Birnbaum to introduce our host, uh, Jerry Gallagher. So here we go, Susan. Welcome, everybody. And um, the reason we are able to be here is because of Jerry Gallagher. And he is going to say a few words about the <coughs> museum and tell you all about our, the centennial. And um, welcome. Thank you. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, my name is Jerry Gallagher. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for the museum. And I've had the pleasure of welcoming various members of GANIC, I think for the last maybe seven or eight One. years, maybe 2013 or 14, when I started to do um, some events for the museum. Um, I'm very happy to uh, to let you all know that we're celebrating our 100th anniversary this year. Woo! So that's great. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And um, as part of the celebration, there are a number of things that are going on throughout the course of the year. But one of the main things that we're so proud of is the brand new exhibition on the third floor of the museum. Yes. Yay! Yay! So, and if you haven't been to see it, um, after the meeting today, the museum will be open until 9 o'clock tonight. That's one of the reasons why we shifted the meeting to Thursday, so that you can come and take advantage of it. And please go upstairs to the third floor and visit it. Uh, the exhibition is called, This is New York. Uh, New York City, uh, 100 years of, uh, the city in 100 years of, uh, I've got it all screwed art. up. <laughs> it's art and pop culture. So um, a lot of people had expectations of the museum doing a retrospective of the museum itself. Um, and over the years, a number of other institutions have come to us to ask for our advice on how they should be celebrating their <coughs> various anniversaries, their 50th anniversary, their 100th anniversary, etc. And we've always advised other institutions to veer away from focusing just on themselves, because that really only becomes of interest to the people who are already associated with the institution. Um, but to instead focus on what the organization has done, um, or ways that they can connect with <coughs> other, other members of the, uh, the general public. So we took our own advice, and rather than focusing on ourselves in the exhibition, we focused on the city that we are here to represent. And, um, uh, looking at New York and how it's represented in various forms of art and pop culture, including literature, film, uh, music, uh, paintings, poetry, um, fashion. There's so many different areas, um, uh, photography, so many different areas that New York is represented in. And um, it's a really great journey through the daily life of New York and the past hundred years of New York. So uh, definitely encourage you to take a look at it. Um, we have uh, booklets upstairs and in the racks by the restrooms, on the information desk and throughout the museum that have different programs that are taking place uh, at the museum throughout the rest of the year. Uh, of note are our annual Uptown Bounce programs, uh, which take place usually at the last two, uh, last two Thursdays in July and the first one or two Thursdays in August. So that actually starts two weeks from today, Uptown Bounce, and it's like a little mini block party, a little mini museum mile festival between the Museum of the City of New York, our neighbor, El Museo del Barrio, and the last couple of years we've added on the Africa Center, which is up at 110th Street, so we're happy to have them partner with us. So we hope you'll, again, go upstairs and see This is New York on the third floor, come back in two weeks, and the following week, and the week after that, or Uptown <laughs> Bounce. Um, We've got a great film series throughout the rest of the year, taking a look at uh, various films that are represented on the third floor, um, and some other fun things. There's a gentleman there who's raising his hand. Did you have a yes, question? Yes, yes. Is the Africa Center open? I, I mean, I know that there's been a cafe there for a while, but I don't know. Is, is there anything like exhibition space there? There is exhibition space uh, on the main floor, the same floor that the cafe is on, and they actually opened up an exhibition, or had an exhibition ready to open up just before COVID, so okay. which was kind of sad because it sat there for you know two years. Um, uh, but they refreshed it, and it opened up um, again just kind of after we were all allowed to open up. And that was a great exhibition. They had had other things up there since then. I'm not sure what's up there now, um, but they are continuing to program their spaces. So 
It's not the full space, but they definitely have some exhibition space on the main floor. Okay. I went to, I forgot what it was called, Manhandler or something, the old movie. Are you going to have DJs for every for Thursday night movies or whatever night it was? It's fabulous. Yes, uh, Moonlight and Movies, space? that's the series, um, of our film series. And um, starting next week, I think, it is <coughs> outdoors. So it's literally Moonlight and Movies that will be out on our back terrace. I think the next one is the Gold Diggers or Gold Gold Diggers of 1933 or something, something like that. Something like that. Are you going to have the DJ? I don't think there's a DJ associated with that one, but I'm not sure. But you can take a look online. That was fun. Yes, yes, I heard that was fantastic. I heard that everybody who was there would love it. Yes, yeah. We will scream. Yes. So what she's referring to is the first film in the film series um, was a silent film. I forget which one was it. Manhandle. 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 And so it's a silent film, and in the old days in silent films, as you all know, you would go, you'd see the film, and there'd be somebody there playing an organ, or playing a piano, or playing the score to the, to the thing. So this year, uh, for this program, we had the silent film, but we engaged a DJ who does a lot of work with the museum, and she curated her own kind of soundtrack to, to the film. So with a lot of contemporary music that fit in with the, the, the film itself. So it's a lot of fun. Great. Well, thank you all very much. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. I apologize on behalf of the entire museum, um, and mostly me. Um, there's something we have a wrong setting on the projector. There are beautiful pictures that are going to be part of the presentation coming up. The words got cut off a little bit, but you'll be able to see the wonderful pictures, and somebody will read the words to you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very thank much, you. Jerry. <laughs> All right, now it's time for the vice president's report. That's me. I'm the vice president. I'm not the president. I know it says that on the agenda. I just want to make sure that's clear. Emma, Emma is uh, on her way to Italy right now, and so I'm standing in her stead. Uh, I want to welcome all of you here. It's uh, really happy to see so many folks. I wasn't sure that everybody was going to get out here in this weather. I have two messages for you. Uh, the first, I'm kind of reminded as I'm standing up here of Hill Street Blues. I don't know how many of us remember. Right, and you remember that the end of every opening segment, the desk sergeant is talking about what's happening that day, and then he says, let's be safe out there, right? And uh, that's really the first thing. Today was a tough day. I don't know if anybody was out. I had a three hour walking tour today. Um, tough air quality, tough in terms of the temperature, the sun, and we really wanna remind people to be safe out there. Make sure that you're taking care of yourself. Um, and make sure that you're taking care of your guests uh, and you're paying attention to their needs and their limitations in this very difficult uh, weather. It's not just because of the Canadian wildfires. It's not just because of the fireworks haze that's lingering for an extra day. It's summer in the city and it's just tough out there. So let's be nice to ourselves and nice to our guests and stay safe out there. That's number one. The second one, uh, is that uh, the board is continuing to interview new members. It's very exciting. We have a significant number of new members that come to us every month. Lots of exciting, interesting people who are excited to be part of GANIC, and we want to remind you to keep up that good work. Don't be blasé about this. Uh, there are a lot of amazing things that GANIC is doing. I mean, Case in point number one, we have the COO of this incredible institution uh, that is here to greet us, uh, who is helping us engineer the best visit possible, right? Changing this to a Thursday so that we're able to take advantage of the late hours of this museum is pretty fantastic. Um, I just wanna remind people of some of the things, again, that we don't take this for granted. Um, there's a lot of exciting stuff happening uh, with the Guides Association. Um, we have all of these fantastic fans, you know about that. Uh, we're gonna hear a little bit more about those later, but um, you know, when I joined 15 years ago, I see some people who remember what it was like 15 years ago. It was not like this. I think we all need to really appreciate how fantastic it is um, that we are able to find ourselves on a monthly basis in these amazing places. Um, we have Little Island organizing with us a private event for us. Little Island wants us to come there for a private event. 
For those of you who were here 15 years ago, I just want you to think about how amazing that is. And for those of you who have been here recently and don't know how far we've come, don't take it for granted. This is pretty exciting. The fact that The Edge wants to throw us a VIP breakfast event, this is amazing stuff. Don't take this for granted. Don't just assume that everybody out there knows what Gannick is about. There's a lot of people who still think of Gannick as what we are 15 years ago. We are new, we are improved, we have a fantastic energetic membership that is able to make these connections. Harvey Davidson was at a meeting of uh, high level New York City folks and he was able to highlight for them something that we've been talking about for a long time and we think that there's gonna be some real progress on this. Uh, he was able to open people's eyes to the conditions on the Brooklyn Bridge nowadays, oh. right? So if any of you are familiar with trying to take a group, and I mean like two people plus yes. across the Brooklyn Bridge today, and you know how challenging that is, none of the officials in that room had any clue. None of them had a clue. When he was describing it, when he's sending them the, the videos that Jeremy yes. took to show them what's happening, um, Gannick is able to make things happen. So make sure that people in the industry know who we are, know what we're doing, and make sure that if they're not a Gannick member, you let them know that they ought to be a Gannick member because of some of this stuff like that. Um, there is a really interesting uh, video uh, that is now, I believe, on the website about Omni. Um, we had someone from the MTA come to us to help explain to us how Omni was going to work for tour guides and tour groups. So check out that video. Uh, I did just want to say one of the, oh, I have so many notes. I'm trying to keep this tight so that we have time to check out the museum. Uh, Jeremy was interviewed in groups today uh, to talk about why people need to hire a licensed New York City guide uh, when they are here. So again, there's lots of fantastic stuff happening. There's one more thing that I want to mention before I throw this over to Bob Gelbert to introduce a couple of other really interesting speakers. Um, and that is tomorrow there's going to be a live Zoom session with a Macy's personal stylist. So if you have been thinking like, how can I get that out there in the summer? How can I look good and feel good um, while I am out there giving my tours? Maybe I need a little bit of a refresh in terms of my styling. This is a free service that Macy's is providing us um, and uh, it is not going to be like Project Runway. Nobody's going to be <laughs> judging you or like voting you off the island. So show up for that free Zoom. It is going to be on the website afterwards as well. So you can always re-watch it. But this personal stylist for Macy's is going to be live. So if you do have questions that you'd like to ask, you'll be able to do that. Tomorrow, check out Wild Apricot because there still should be a good amount of space to sign. So I'm going to toss this over to Bob. He's going to introduce our next two speakers. And then when they're done, he's going to introduce our guest speaker for today. So Bob is the man of the hour. Uh, so thank you all for coming tonight. I always love being here. And thank you, Susan, for getting us here. And Susan also took care of next month as well. But I'll talk about that in my industry relations report. So uh, last week, at the very last minute, someone connected me with two people who had created an event six years ago that I had never heard of and felt that all of you should know about it and possibly in some way be involved in it. And it's called the Village Trip. It is a festival. This year it will be September 9th, 15 days, and uh, I have the two joint artistic directors, Liz Thompson, who also founded it, and it was her idea, and Cliff Pearson. And it is an event that celebrates Greenwich Village and the East Village's arts and activism. So I'm going to shut up and bring them up here. <laughs> Thanks for coming out on such a warm evening. Uh, I see a Mets fan with Co-Mets. Um, so I'm Cliff Pearson. I actually live in New York City. I've lived in the West Village for most of the last 30 something years. Um, Liz? Yeah, I'm, 
was born and I still live in London, but I came fa became fascinated by the music of this place and I came to know as Greenwich Village in the late 60s when I was not even in my teens. And the village existed in my mind's ear long before I set foot in New York uh, in 95 as a journalist, in fact. And um, I discovered during my trips as a journalist, writing about the book trade and occasionally music, and staying at the historic Washington Square Hotel, I discovered there was no festival celebrating the village. So um, after a few years, when I was free of, free of various obligations, I invented one. And uh, I mean, I, that is to say, I kind of formed a proper plan. I talked about it to people. And everyone thought I was nuts. Although I have to say, mostly it was my English friends who thought I was nuts. The Americans were wonderfully welcoming. I mean, the doors opened to me in New York. And here we are. This is our fifth festival. Obviously, we missed a year. Uh, Cliff and I have worked together for three years. He's the perfect partner. Um, and it's grown from three days in, tw in 2018 to um, 16 now, if you just can't do the maths. <laughs> in fact, we have a little sort of, we're opening on the 8th for some really special quirky event which celebrates Sati and John Cage. Um, so, you go first. Um, so it's going to be September 8th through the 24th. Originally, like about a week ago, I thought it was going to be the 9th through the 23rd, but things keep getting bigger. <laughs> we keep getting more ambitious. Um, this year it's going to be really amazing. Um, it's going to include everything from music, all kinds of music, tours, talks, panel discussions. We're going to have a, an amazing event at the Great Hall on September 21st. And that's going to be uh, honoring the uh, 60th anniversary of the March on Washington. So that's going to look at music and civil rights. Um, so that's going to be really incredible. We can't name some of the people who are involved, but it's going to be some big name people who are going to be performing there. Um, we're also going to do a special Ukraine Day on September 10th. Yeah, we have Celebrate Ukraine. Uh, we're raising money for the Ukraine <coughs> Children's Action Project, and someone, some of you might already have seen uh, Irwin and Karen Redliner, plus with Joan Myers on television in Kiev and Lviv this week. Um, we're going to raise money for the fund, but we're trying to celebrate the culture of Ukraine because you know we've just seen the grim stuff, and it would be great to, to understand and you know we've all been through the cycle, but to celebrate the culture. So we've got all kinds of stuff happening, including a piano playathon, and a band actually from Odessa, who are making their New York debut. And they found us somehow. They play gangster folk. They describe themselves. So they'll be playing at drop. So all those events will raise money for the Ukraine Children's. Action projects, classical music, um, gangster folk, all kinds of stuff. Um, we have uh, two celebrations, two events mark Rosh Hashanah. One is Avram Pengus, who some of you might know in drum, but we also have the great Janice Siegel of the Manhattan Transfer, who's doing her album Mazel with a cantor from a synagogue in Brooklyn and a John DiMartino pianist. We're doing um, wonderful uh, excerpts of Wonderful Town, which we did small scale last year at the Washington Square Hotel, is moving, is transferring to Joe's Pub with Jamie Bernstein, <coughs> my first daughter, and Janice. And ja Jamie is giving us a, a tour of the on the town locations, which is very exciting. She's a great, she's very gay um, and great fun. And what else? And we've got Gail Papp, widow of Joe Papp, is making her first, um, doing her first book event with us at the Public Theatre. What else we got? And she's going to be in conversation with George C. Wolfe, mm -hmm. who's a you know, Tony Award winning uh, uh, playwright, director. Um, he's also made some movies and has a new movie coming out that he's done with the Obamas um, with their production company, um, Bayard Rustin, who was a civil rights leader, um, who was one of Martin Luther King's <coughs> lieutenants. But because he was gay, he was sort of pushed to the sidelines in terms of history. So George C. Wolfe has just made a documentary film about him. Um, we're also going to be having, we always have a uh, free concert in Washington Square Park. So that's going to be on Saturday, September 23rd. And that's going to have uh, a Latin jazz band called People of Earth and um, a, a band of three women from the East Village called Betty and a hip hop group called uh, Peace Poets. So that's, so that's going to be a really interesting combination. <laughs> we've got lots of classical music, jazz, we've got walks and talks, and uh, our artist emeritus is 
the great David Amram, who's 92 going on 23, um, who was the first composer of Shakespeare in the Park, Leonard Bernstein's first composer in residence, the composer of Manchurian Candidates, Lender in the Grass, and we have a very special event around him this year. We don't have an announcer yet, but we have something very special. <coughs> So he'll be at our opening block party on 8th Street between 5th and 6th Avenue, and that will be uh, September 9th. So all sorts of stuff. Yeah. You can go to our website, www.thevillagetrip.com. Um, we're continually updating it, especially now. Um, you can sign up for the newsletter. We don't bombard you. It's, well, it's more frequent now, <coughs> one every 10 days, but that's about it. So. You know, talk about it, spread the word. Um, it's always a lot of fun. It's usually a yeah. good time of year for, for tours and things. So. Lots, of, lots free. If you have any queries, please email us. We'll respond as quickly as we can. Um, but you know, it's, it's a certain, we're not in competition with anyone. This is a putting the big t a big tent over the East and West Village and celebrating its, you know, as a Brit, I don't want to sound like a carpetbagger. I love that you, you've <laughs> given so much to the world and we're celebrating that. and. It has to be treasured before you know development just kind of a pile driver wipes half of it away. So that's what we're celebrating. The village is a special, unique, a village, but a global village that's given a huge amount to the world. So please check out the website, direct people down here. <coughs> Come down yourself yep. and have a good time. We'd be pleased to welcome you. Great. Anyway, thanks for giving us some time. <laughs>
while there is much written about Central Park and Fifth Avenue, for example, there are only bits and pieces here and there about Riverside Park and Riverside Drive. So my goal with Heaven on the Hudson was to bring together the story of the history and the architecture and the people of the neighborhood all in one place and tell it from the personal point of view of a long-term resident. Um, the book is actually in two parts. Uh, the first part is all the history, and then the second part is really a walking tour of the different sections of the neighborhood. And my hope is that the history interests people enough to inspire them to actually take a walk and see what I'm talking about. Um, my plan tonight is to tell the tale of the early history of Riverside Park and Riverside Drive, and you will, as you will see, they are intrinsically linked. And I'd like to do that not by running through a series of events, but rather by looking at the development of the neighborhood through the eyes and the thoughts and the deeds and whenever possible, the, the fabulous mansions of the people responsible for creating it, those who conceived it and promoted it and designed it and then later redesigned it to make it the Riverside Park that we know today. Uh, importantly, many of those early 19th and early 20th century people actually lived in the neighborhood. So this was not just a, a massive municipal project or um, a, a really intriguing uh, financial investment. It was part of that as well. Um, but this was their home. They were the pioneers of that part of the Upper West Side. So that said, and forgive the glitches here, please, as you heard earlier. The original Riverside Park extended from 72nd Street to 129th Street along the Great Hudson River on New York's Upper West Side. Picture, if you would, what life in this area must have been like 500 plus years ago in the time of the Native American Lenape, and then in the early 1600s, the era of the first Dutch settlers. A high, rocky cliff was bordered along the river by deep green forest, undisturbed, save for hunting and gathering. By the late 1600s and into the 1700s, that scenery had begun to change, largely due to huge land grants by the English, some 150 acres or more per person. To put that into perspective, a football field is roughly equivalent to one acre, meaning these early settlers owned about 150 football fields worth of prime real estate where Riverside Park and Drive stand today. The goal of these grants was to create European settlements where there were none. A few farms arose on this land, followed by a smattering of grand estates or country seats inhabited by families such as the Delanceys, Anthorps, and Livingstons. That oh so handsome gentleman on the left um, is Henry Broncos Livingston, about whom you will hear more later. His family back then was sworn enemies of the family of the gentleman on the right, Oliver Delancey. <laughs> the Apthorps, meanwhile, lived just down the road. In the 1800s, what we know as the Upper West Side, especially close to the Hudson River, became that century's version of the Hamptons. A beautiful waterside escape for the wealthy filled with lavish homes. As one promotional brochure for the development of Riverside put it, ever so dreamily, in the olden time, when this region between the Central Park and Riverside Park was occupied with the villas of the wealthy and luxurious New York merchants, it surpassed anything in the land for the elegance of its buildings and the beauty of its landscape gardening. The photo here is of the William Ponsambi Furnace Home either built in the 1830s, 1840s, or acquired at that time from an Apthorpe descendant and later much expanded. Furness was an American who made his fortune in the shipping business. He lived most of the year downtown, but each spring traveled uh, with his wife and six children to his uptown estate. 
When Furness died in 1871, his Riverside Drive estate was valued at about $1 million, or $23 million in today's currency. Mm -hmm. After their parents had passed away, the Furness siblings rented out their childhood home, advertising it in 1871 as a country house and grounds, Riverview, stable, <coughs> gardener's lodge with five rooms, garden and fruit trees, house containing 16 rooms, oven and kitchen range with hot and cold water, stationary tubs, oil cloth, etc. Also to let six acres or less adjoining. It was said of the mansion's early days, the lawn sloped to the water's edge. Here were heard the merry shouts of romping children who loved the house as their birthplace and played in the lush grass and blossoming groves with the freedom of country life, or bathed or floated, feeling a sense of proprietorship of the river that then was only dotted with occasional sails and formed a gentle boundary to their parental domain. Doesn't that sound wonderful? And so the lovely, peaceful, and bucolic area <laughs> remained until 1846, when the Hudson River Railroad, later merged with the New York Central Railroad, slashed through those dense virgin woods that had been home to hunters to lay tracks along the waterfront, allowing freight trains to run between New York City and Albany. But the history of Riverside Park and Riverside Drive is as much history of people as it is of events. And today I'd like to share the stories of those who had the most impact on the area's development. The men I like to call the leading social influencers of their time. Some of their names you will know, others have been lost to time. For tonight, let's bring them back. Toward that end, I'd like to share first the stories of the most notable men who made the park and drive. Cyrus Clark, Edward Veeley, William R. Martin, Andrew Haswell Green, Frederick Law Olmsted, and Calvin Fox, and then the tale of one power broker, the man everyone loves to hate, Robert Moses. Before that, however, let me point out here that developing the Upper West Side as a whole had its challenges. There were rocky outcroppings everywhere, time-consuming and expensive to blast away. There was an insane asylum where Columbia University is today, and no one wanted to be near what they termed the local maniacs. Squatters populated the area. For a long time, there was no public transportation from the Upper West Side to the downtown business district, but there were freight trains, dirty, noisy freight trains, and more on them later. <laughs> Cyrus Park. Cyrus Park was once well known as the father of the West Side. He was so called for his role as a premier champion of the area, as well as one of its major investors. Keep in mind here that the men who fought most forcibly for the development of Riverside Park and Riverside Drive happened to be those who would make the most money if, in fact, they succeeded. Nothing new there. Clark lobbied for neighborhood improvements such as mass transit and street lamps and specifically for Riverside Park and Riverside Drive. He was for many years president of the West End Association, previously called the West Side Association. It was formed by leading businessmen to promote public improvements north of 59th Street and west of Central Park, thereby bettering both quality of life and the value of their property investments. You'll hear the West End Association referred to frequently in this evening also note that what we now call the West Side was built on, more often referred to as the West End. Clark had built a significant personal fortune in the wholesale silk business, and clearly a man with foresight, later studied real estate development. In 1866, he purchased the house and extensive property of Henry Rockle Livingston, the distinctive looking gentleman pictured earlier. That house, known as Oak Villa, was built before 1811 near what is now 19th Street and Riverside Drive. After the park opened, Clark commissioned a new house, seen here, um, also on 90th Street, but directly across the street from the old house. 
It was faced with rough cut granite and had a marvelous red tile roof distinguished by a delightful array of chimneys and dormers and two wonderful spiky towers. And it was surrounded by porches that were the ideal setting for the area's stunning views of the river and beyond. At the time, it cost the outlandish sum of $90,000. What did the Clark see from those ivy-covered porches? Steamships and sailboats, ferries and small fishing boats, and tugboats too. After Clark's death, a sculptural Bronzewood Reef Memorial was created in his honor, and you can't see it, <laughs> but it's there, um, and embedded in a rock, out, rock outcropping in the 83rd Street entrance to Riverside Park, where, if you look carefully, it may still be seen today. Next, Ex Egbert Ludovicus Vili. Aside from possessing a delicious middle name, Vili, like his neighbor Cyrus Clark, played an important role in the development of the Upper West Side. Also like Clark, Vili was a key member of the West End Association. He actively promoted mass transit through the area and was an outspoken proponent of Riverside Park. What we would today call a true multi-hyphenate, Vili was a West Point graduate, Army Brigadier General, surveyor, U.S. representative from New York, one of the first sanitary engineers in the country, and engineer-in-chief of Central Park. Interestingly, he also submitted a design for Central Park, but lost that competition to Frederick Law Olmsted, about whom you will hear more in a few minutes. Amelia was responsible for the Vealy Map, published in the 1860s and celebrated as a great cartographic masterpiece. The map shows New York City's waterways, canals, swamps, rivers, and more, superimposed over the street grid. Mm. It has been referenced during the construction of some of the city's most famous buildings, including the Empire State Building and the World Trade Center. Really maintained that as the city paved over bodies of water and leveled out natural drainage channels on its march of town, underground waterways would stagnate, leading to yellow fever, malaria, and new plague among other diseases. As a result, he campaigned vigorously for an effective sewer and sanitation system, becoming a key lobbyist for the Metropolitan <coughs> Health Law of 1866. Notably, this was the first New York State legislation for the comprehensive control of sanitary conditions in the city. And most importantly for our story, the bill's requirements applied when it came to clearing out the disease-breeding water breeding waters of the Upper West Side, contributing greatly to the region's development. Throughout the 1870s, sewers and water mains were built in the area. Also like Clark, Vealey was an enthusiastic believer in the area's worth and future. He wrote, this entire region combines in its general aspect all that is magnificent in the leading capitals of Europe. In our Riverside Avenue, the equivalent of the Chiaia of Naples and the Corso of Rome. <laughs> I love the drama. There was a lot of this, a great deal of hyperbole and over-the-top enthusiasm, both by individuals and the media at the time, when it came to the likely future of the era. <coughs> Vili really anticipated that the Upper West Side would become home to what he termed a higher order of domestic architecture than it has been the good fortune of New York heretofore to possess. <laughs> and maintained that it would evolve into one of Manhattan's most desirable residential districts. On the personal side, in 1872, Vealey built a red brick, ivy-covered villa for his family on what would later be Riverside Drive. As you can see, uh, perfectly rounded windows embellished the tallest of the home's many towers. The mansion faced south with a broad veranda extending around the south, west, and east sides. Look closely at this picture, and you will see the man himself standing on the steps of his estate. Now, <clears throat> while extremely confident about the area's future, Vili was less so about his own. He harbored a fear of being buried alive, <laughs> which apparently was an unfortunate but surprisingly common problem in the early 19th century. And upon his death in 1902, he had 
a buzzer installed mm -hmm. in this pyramid-shaped mausoleum at West Point, right here, which, if pressed by him, would alert someone in the cemetery office. <laughs> <laughs> I am happy to share with you that there is no record of it ever having been put into service. <laughs> Next, we have William R. Martin. Now, Martin was a man with a mission and great skill in marketing that mission. At the time, Martin, a lawyer and real estate speculator, was a parks commissioner as well as president of, you guessed it, the West End Association. Uh, in 1865, 15 years before Riverside Drive and Riverside Park became a reality, he published that pamphlet <coughs> called The Grove of New York that proposed changing 12th Avenue into a combined scenic carriage drive and park along the Hudson River. Riverside Avenue, as Riverside Drive was originally known, was conceived as an elegant and expansive boulevard lined with trees overlooking the park and the waterfront and bordered by imposing mansions. Now Martin envisioned the future development as forming the city's preeminent residential street expected to eclipse Fifth Avenue with ease. This vision of Riverside Drive as the new Fifth Avenue is the key theme throughout the early development of Park and Drive. In his pamphlet, Martin imagined a time when West Side residents, and I'm quoting, could come out of a summer afternoon upon the Riverside Park and through its drives and walks, among its flowers, under the cool shade of its old trees, in its casinos, meaning small buildings here, and refreshment houses, could have in the city all the enjoyment of a millionaire in his $100,000 villa at Irvington, a village on the Hudson River in Westchester County. Now I ask you, what investor or homeowner in his right mind could resist a description like that? Other enterprising gentlemen of the era quickly shared their own romantic visions for the city. Quoting again here, the 8th Avenue, it was predicted on the west flank of the park, in other words, Central Park West, would become a street of millionaires' mansions, outdoing even Fifth Avenue in spectacle and grandeur. West End Avenue, it was asserted, would one day become a magnificent shopping street. Well, we know that never happened. And an even grander future was predicted for Riverside Drive. Andrew Hazel Green. The next step toward fulfilling this static real estate reverie that was going on at the time occurred the year after Martin's pamphlet, when Andrew Haswell Green introduced an act to the New York State Legislature for the development of a park and drive along the Hudson River. A lawyer, <coughs> a civic leader, and the giant of 19th century planning, Green is considered the father of Greater New York, a name given to him by President Theodore Roosevelt for Green's leadership role in consolidating the city's five boroughs making New York, at the time, the world's second largest city after London. Cyrus Clark, remember, was simply the father of the Upper West Side. Green also served as president of the Board of Education and as the city controller, and for three years, he was active in or led the Central Park Commission. Green was a key driver behind major New York City sites, including Central Park, the New York Public Library, the New York Zoological Society, and Botanical Gardens, the American Museum of Natural History, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. No slouch. The act Green presented to the legislature became law in 1867, empowering the Central Park commissioners to acquire land above 72nd Street between the Heights and the railroad tracks for Riverside Park and Riverside Drive. This was, so to speak, the Green Light. Land was then purchased in several stages, with the first portion secured through eminent domain in 1872. Now, here comes the juicy part. <laughs> it was not until many years after all of this that Cornelius M. Williams, either, either, mistook a green for a man who was having an affair with William's lover, or, depending on the account, thought Green was protecting a woman who had spread fake news about Williams. In any case, Williams, 
stock five times right in front of his house in the middle of the afternoon, killing him. And here's a photo of the funeral. Um, in honor of Green's contribution to the city, the flags of City Hall were lowered to half mast. In his Encyclopedia of New York City, architectural historian Kenneth T. Jackson called Green, and that's the quote that's half missing, arguably the most important leader in Gotham's long history. More important, more important than Peter Stuyvesant, Alexander Hamilton, Frederick Law Olmsted, Robert Moses, and Fiorella LaGuardia, which I think you'll agree is saying something. With the land now ready for park and residential development, it was crucial to find a fitting design for what was to be an entirely new community. One meant to attract the city's foremost families. Remember, again, everyone is thinking Fifth Avenue West Side Village. The park commissioners turned to none other than Frederick Law Olmsted to design Riverside Drive and Riverside Park, the upper and lower levels respectively, of this extensive and exciting new undertaking. To answer a question that I had before beginning Heaven on the Hudson, and which you may have as well, yes, the park and drive were both part of the same project, undertaken and opened, although not completed, the same year. We've talked about the men who most influenced the development of the park and drive. Now let's look at the man who designed them, or at least the original version of them. I'm sure everyone in this meeting knows the name of Frederick Law Olmsted and that he designed Central Park. But did you know that he also designed Riverside Park and Riverside Drive? That, in fact, is rarely mentioned in the summaries of his work. Olmsted was the principal landscape architect of his time and a leading pioneer of that profession. But this field, as you may know, was not his first choice. For many years, Olmsted pursued a most varied career as a journalist and author. He traveled throughout the American South and Texas for the New York Daily Times, now known as the New York Times. Beyond that, Olmsted served as Executive <coughs> Secretary of the United States Sanitary Commission, a precursor to the Red Cross. He took part in the organization of the Southern Famine Relief Commission after the Civil War, and later helped create the New York State Charities Aid <coughs> Association, where he served as Vice President for many years. Olmsted was also active in the founding of the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the American Museum of Natural History. In 1857, he was named Central Park Superintendent. And as if, as if all of that were not enough, in 1872, he was nominated for Vice President of the United States by a splinter group of liberal Republicans. Although flattered, Olmsted withdrew his name from consideration. Olmsted had a background in both engineering and farming, as well as a belief that exposure to nature by all classes was important to the health of society. At a time when so-called parks were most likely to be within private estates, or like Gramercy Park, locked behind gates to which only the wealthy had keys, this was a novel concept. Along with being a man of extraordinary achievements, Olmsted was also said to be of a very kind disposition. According to his obituary, it is related of him that he once remodeled his plans for extensive private grounds when it was found that they would interfere with a mother watching her children at play and change them entirely so that the mother might not lose the pleasant vista. Apocryphal as that may or may not be, it's a wonderful story. <laughs> He also married his brother's widow and adopted their three children. When Olmsted was 73 years old, the famous artist John Singer Sargent painted this portrait of him, and this is what I'm really sorry to have cut off because it's just fabulous. Portrait of him leaning on his cane against a bucolic scene of flowers and trees. We have over 100 illustrations in Heaven on the Hudson, and, and this is actually one of my favorites. Olmsted was commissioned for the Riverside Project in 1873 
and submitted a preliminary plan that year and a final plan two years later, designed to develop Riverside Park and Riverside Drive together. And here is that plan with Olmsted's signature in the lower right hand corner. Olmsted's proposal for Park and Drive featured a design to fit the area's hilly, rocky topography. A different, less inspired plan presented before his involvement pictured a straight drive 100 feet wide that followed the city's street grid rather than the shifting contours of the cliffs. Carrying out this first approach would have required extensive leveling and regrading and the construction of a retaining wall far too high for uh, practical access to the park. Discontent of this unimaginative and impractical scheme led to Olmsted's hiring. I suspect that the fact that <coughs> Olmsted's design would also cost less than the original plan because it required a lower retaining wall uh, and less landfill likely did not escape the city's notice. In Olmsted's vision, the park's eastern border would follow the area's undulating pattern of nature. He wrote that the location presented great advantages as a park because the riverbank had been for a century occupied as the lawns and ornamental gardens in front of the country seats along its banks. Its foliage was fine and its views magnificent. He incorporated those gardens and their foliage into his design. According to the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission, Olmsted combined the land purchased for the avenue and that purchased for the park. He considered the existing grades and contours, the existing plantings and views, and designed a winding drive that would be comfortable for both horses and pleasure driving, provide shaded walks for pedestrians, and yet would give easy access to real estate bordering it on the east. Olmsted considered this location ideal for hosting the city's main promenade for drivers, riders, and walkers alike, and designed it to be long and wide enough to accommodate different types of traffic and activities. As you can see here, plans for Riverside Drive, which would parallel the Park and River, included a tree-lined pedestrian walkway, a lane for horseback riding, there we go, uh, and two broad lanes for carriages, with a median separating northbound traffic <coughs> from southbound. Olmsted's proposal stated, part of the main highway, specifically that portion between 104th and 123rd Streets, was to be arranged as a public promenade to command views over the Hudson and to be shaded in all of its parts. North of 123rd Street, in the park and the, the park and the drive were to be arranged to allow a resting and turning place for carriages from which the view of the river was to be kept as open as possible. Finally, by early 1877, work began on Riverside Park and Riverside Drive. At that time, the largest and most ambitious single municipal road building project ever undertaken in New York. Now is the time to note one very important historical. Olmsted's Riverside Park ended at the railroad tracks. It was park, <coughs> train tracks, Hudson River, nothing in between. As was typical for the era, the vacant land to the west of the tracks would be developed with commercial docks to serve the shipping companies that ply their trade along the waterfront. Also keep in mind that the commercial use of land bordering the river would be a major point of contention for years to come. Also notable is that although he was responsible for the sweep and swerve of Riverside Drive, Olmsted's work did not, in the end, extend to the park's interior. In 1878, two years before Riverside Park's official opening, Olmsted was removed as park superintendent because of Tammany Hall politics. Put another way, Boss Tweed fired the god of landscape architecture. <laughs> Some years later, 
William R. Martin, you remember, it was Martin who enthusiastically promoted the whole Riverside Park Riverside Drive idea, wrote Olmsted, asking if he, Olmsted, would consider further consultation on Riverside Park. Olmsted would not, writing, I don't want to bother with New York politics and will not move a finger to secure any engagement with the department, meaning the park department, nor have anyone else do so in my behalf. That's done, I'll tell you. In any case, over the next few decades, post Olmsted, there was no comprehensive plan for the design of the park's interior, nor was Olmsted's original concept for it fully developed. Instead, the interior was developed by a series of designers employed by the Parks Department, including Calvert Vox, Olmsted's old business partner. Vox was appointed superintendent architect of the Department of Public Parks and was likely responsible for laying out the park's first set of paths. Apparently, no one really knows what Vox's role was in Riverside Park. All that said, Riverside Park and Riverside Drive opened in 1880, but not without drama. The park itself debuted in March of that year, but the drive was delayed until May. Throughout the Riverside project, there were disputes with the contractors, big surprise, about money, deadlines, and construction materials. In spring of 1880, this came to the boiling point. In response, the builders barricaded all the existing cross streets with piles of stones, derricks, kind of crane, and heavy timbers, and posted guards to arrest any attempted trespassers, effectively cutting off Riverside Drive access to property owners. This did not go over well. <laughs> Sometime past midnight on May 7th, 100 or so individuals picked up what stood in their way and hurled it over the retaining wall into the park below. As a result, and I'm quoting from the media at the time, the sun rose on Riverside Avenue, open for the first time from one end to the other. This is my favorite part. The citizens along the avenue were jubilant, and all of them conveniently ignorant as to the man under whose orders the barriers had been destroyed. Once they were opened, park and drive alike were a huge success, especially among equestrians and later bicyclists. Photos show the drive bustling with open carriages and strollers in 19th century finery. Studebaker, a carriage manufacturer before it began producing automobiles, ran advertisements featuring a well-heeled lady enjoying a carriage ride down the avenue. The day's equestrians frequently rode to the north end of Central Park, then up 7th Avenue and back down along Riverside Park. Throughout the mid to late 1890s, when cycling in the city drew thousands of riders and spectators alike, the drive was New York's most popular setting. Harper's Weekly called it the paradise of bicyclists. The New York Times declared the Sunday procession of cyclists has got to be one of the sights of the city. On any given day, carriage drivers, behatted equestrians, and carefully balanced cyclists would compete for space and the opportunity both to enjoy the view and be part of it. Park and Drive eventually attracted homeowners who created amazing residences. As of the mid-1880s, about a dozen large freestanding homes, known as villas, bordered the park on the drive. And by the 1890s, construction was in full swing. Keep in mind that these were not the row houses that remained today. <coughs> the villas filled far more than a single lot. And at least one of them and its garden took up an entire square block. Oh, that's not that. This is, <laughs> that's a different one. This is my favorite one. So one of my favorite homes, uh, and one of only two freestanding villas remaining on the drive, is the Shenazi Mansion, which looks much the same now as it did when it was built in 1909. It belonged to Moore Shenazi, <coughs> a tobacco baron, who began his professional life as a cemetery guard. This bright white limestone construction encompasses 
12,000 square feet and what was originally 35 rooms. And it is chock full of shiny marble and glistening mosaics and carved wood. It is glorious. I confess to spending a lot of time standing across the street and staring what at it. What street is that on? 107th yeah. Street in Riverside. Mm -hmm. The families that moved to Riverside Drive early on were well off, but in most cases, not all, more upper and upper middle class entrepreneurs, bankers, and professionals than robber baron level of wealthy. <coughs> Why? Because despite the glories of Riverside Park and Drive, the clean air, the excellent transportation, the views and more, the really rich, the Astros, the Vanderbilts, the Morgans, and the rest, had no interest in moving. They were more than content to stay exactly what they, where they were, uh, with their own kind, where the women could easily visit each other and drop off their cards or shop local stores, and men could gather at local clubs. They didn't need more. From their point of view, they already had everything. That glorious view of the river and the Palisades from the Upper West Side, why travel all the way across town and uptown when they already had their water view in Newport? Sadly, starting in the early decades of the 20th century, Riverside Park began to slip into a major state of decline. What happened? The railroad's ever-increasing dominance of the park and a general neglect of what made this space special. From the early days of Riverside Park and Riverside Drive, the railroad had affronted the senses of those who lived on the avenue and those who, as a result, determined never to do so. Today, a passing train's low whistle from within the tunnel, followed by a deep guttural chug, is to me a soothing sound. But back then, the endless clattering of wheels over open air tracks grated on the nerves. All the while, passing steam engines spewed smoke upward to the drive and its residents, accompanied by the scents of the livestock being transported to the downtown butcheries and the garbage dumps lining the tracks. As you might imagine, summer, when windows were thrown open for cool breezes from the river, presented a particular challenge to resident olfactory glands. In addition, during the depression of the 1930s, <coughs> the dispossessed had set up living quarters alongside the tracks <coughs> and river. As of April 1934, there were 52 structures known as veterans shacks within the seven blocks between 72nd Street and 79th Street alone. At the same time, the railroad continued to block access to the waterfront, except for commercial purposes, separating the community from the river with barbed wire fences. And you can, well, <laughs> you can kind of see those there now. Um, so, Despite its vital role in commerce, the railroad increasingly came to be viewed as a nuisance rather than an essential and inevitable part of the park. There were multiple efforts from the 1870s on by community organizations and the city alike to force the railroad to clean up its act. Finally, to the delight of many, in 1913, the New York State Legislature pressured the railroad into developing a plan to enclose the tracks in a tunnel that could support a park or an esplanade from West 72nd Street to West 123rd Street. Yet, it was more than a decade later before change began to happen. In 1924, the passage of the Kaufman Act mandated that all the trains in New York City run on electric power rather than steam. Electric powered trains were not possible at grade level, primarily for safety reasons. Around that time, meanwhile, the automobile <coughs> began to dominate as a form of transportation. One third of New York City residents had cars, traffic choked the streets, and there was interest in, among officials in creating a highway along the western end of Manhattan to decrease congestion and provide a rapid route to and from the city, as well as an opportunity for scenic pleasure driving. Also, in 1924, Charles Craig, the city's controller, proposed a plan for a parkway in Hudson to alleviate tra traffic on local streets. 
The idea was to use a landfill to extend the park past the railroad shacks and include an esplanade along the waterfront as well as a roadway, uh, in this case on top of an enclosed railway. The project would also involve landscaping the new land, restoring the existing park, and providing playgrounds and athletic facilities. Craig's plan was the first of four recommendations for Riverside Park's reconstruction proposed in the 1920s alone, not a single one of which was implemented that decade. One problem was that while there was, uh, there was overall support for Parkway, there was no consensus on where exactly it should go. Some, like Craig, suggested building the parkway above the proposed railroad tunnel, which would have brought the sounds of passing cars much closer to the residents of Riverside Drive than they are now. And frankly, as a Riverside Drive resident, I'm really glad that one did not succeed. Others preferred converting the top of the tunnel into parkland and building a waterfront parkway instead. Various civic organizations weighed in. The City Club endorsed building the parkway on the waterfront to give more space to recreational uses. <coughs> time, however, the waterfront parkway proposal had little support, and the Board of Estimate voted it down. The Women's League for the Protection of Riverside Park opposed building the parkway within the park. Leaflets announcing a meeting organized by the League encouraged New Yorkers to save Riverside Park, it belongs to all, and parents save Riverside Park for your children. Finally, by the late 1920s, the city and New York Central agreed to share the cost of covering the tracks and building what would become the original elevated West Side Highway to 72nd Street. In June 1929, the city approved a plan that would build the parkway above the tracks, not in the waterfront. All was at last good to go. And guess what happened a few months later? <laughs> crash, yes, yes, the stock market crashed. And plans for railroad tunnel and highway alike, which pardon the expression, stopped in their tracks. <laughs> While all of this was happening, or rather not happening, Riverside Park itself was suffering from neglect. Water had destroyed, um, some of the existing landfill, forming massive puddles in various spots where it had seeped through. Mud was everywhere, sucking at the heels of those in search of a straw. Basically, between the railroads and the rain, Riverside Park was a mess. Then came Robert Moses. <laughs> 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 Brilliant, impatient, ruthless, arrogant, powerful, and politically savvy. Moses knew exactly what he wanted to do with Riverside Park and Drive, and he was going to let no one and nothing, not mayors, not money, stand in his way. Moses lived on the Upper West Side much of his life. As a young man, he often visited Riverside Drive, looked out over the park from the high bluffs, and in his book, uh, The Power Broker, author Robert Caro writes that what Moses saw in Riverside Park then was, quote, a wasteland, nothing but a vast, low-lying mass of dirt and mud. But very early on, Moses had a vision of what it should be. And by the early 1930s, he had the position and the power to realize his vision for Riverside. Moses, then park commissioner, introduced his West Side Improvement Plan. This enormous undertaking involved covering over the New York Central Railroad tracks and transforming Riverside Park. And that was not all. It also included completing the West Side Elevated Highway, begun earlier but then abandoned, constructing the new Henry Hudson Parkway, and then connecting the highway to the parkway at 72nd Street. Accumulating the required city, state, and federal <coughs> funds in the midst of the depression required exceptional skill along with, often enough, a strenuous bending or even breaking of the rules. Needless to say, Moses got the money. 
The focal point of the Moses expansion was the multi-purpose rotunda here at 79th Street, which not only featured a traffic circle providing an easy entrance to and exit from the Henry Hampson Parkway, but most importantly, thanks to the sunken circular plaza that led to the border, it granted New Yorkers long-awaited access to the river beyond the few existing narrow footbridges that led to the yacht, cl yacht clubs along the shore. People could finally get to the water without risking life and limb crossing the tracks. The structure's lower levels in Moses' time hosted a fountain and a restaurant with an arcaded terrace overlooking a marina that was designed to be the city's front door for visiting yachts and marine dignitaries. As for the railroad, Moses encased it in a tunnel under the park from 72nd to 123rd Street, eliminating street-level railroad crossings. The top of the tunnel was then allocated to parkland. Remember, Olmsted's Park stopped at the railroad tracks. There was nothing beyond the tracks, not the promenade, none of the playgrounds, none of the rec recreational facilities that we see today until Moses. To accomplish that, Changes included filling in the park to the east of the train tunnel to raise the grades to the height of the new railroad route, flattening sharp slopes, and removing and replacing many of the original stairways, paths, and landings. Because of the Promethean changes made during Moses' era to accommodate the tunnel and the parkway, the interior of the park, for the most part, was no longer the vision of Olmsted or the work of the landscape living on the year following him. Instead, it is the master design of park and drive together for which Olmsted deserves the greatest recognition today. The sinuous drive adapted to the topography's stripping contours, the islands separating <coughs> the main and ancillary roadways, and the retaining wall best represent Olmsted's lasting impact on Riverside Park and Riverside Drive when compared to developments in the Moses era. Along with expanding far beyond the tracks, the Moses Park focused on recreation, while the original was not. The 1930s design created a profusion of playgrounds and sports facilities, including basketball, tennis, handball and volleyball courts, ball fields, and more. Under Moses, it took just three years, three years, 1934 to 1937 for the entire West Side Improvement Plan to be implemented. Can you imagine a project of that size happening with that speed today? In the process, landfill nearly doubled Riverside Park size, adding 132 acres to the original 191. There was a man-made promenade within the park for the first time over the tracks enclosed by the tunnel. All of this covered tracks, playgrounds, recreational facilities, additional park space, was along with the marina, rotunda, and of course, the completed West Side Highway and the new Henry Hudson Parkway. When work was finished, noted one observer, quote, Riverside Park was once again one of the most elegant parks in the city. And so, in my opinion, it remains today. There is more to the story of Riverside Park and Riverside Drive, of course. A few decades after Moses, the entire city <coughs> declined and the park and drive with it. But then its neighbors took up arms, restored it, took care of it, and made it a warm and welcoming place to be once again. But that is a story for another evening. <laughs> Thank you.
And that, from what I understand, was part of it. He didn't like all sorts of politics. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, the road houses, were they incorporated in Moses' plan to um, redevelop the area? Uh, no, they were, um, they were there already. He didn't touch those. Mm. He worked on the park itself and the walkway along on Riverside, on the park side. But he really didn't, he didn't touch the buildings. Because you originally said they weren't there, so. They weren't they there. Came then, when they came when? They came um, really in the 1890s, so way before Moses. They weren't there when the villas I was referring to at the time were built. They, those were the earliest, and then came the, the roadhouses, and then many years later, the apartment buildings. Um, huh. Yes? Um, you had mentioned a roundabout, to, uh, like a Vivian Second Street. I, I remember the street, but there is a roundabout to get on to the west side of the highway. Is that 79. 79. So that's not the same one, right? It, it did, did I say 72nd? Yeah. I should have said 79. 79. 79. 79. 79. 79. Yeah, that's uh, that's the one. Yes. Are there further plans to extend the Riverside Park? No. Well, I mean, where can you go? <laughs> and so, well, now it's, it's all the way up to 155th Street. So that happened. Later, <laughs> and I don't actually. The, the book itself focuses on the original. Of there's been no proposals. Space. So there's no proposals that I know. There's a lot of work going on at 79th Street with the rotunda and the boat base and right. so forth, and very controversial. But nothing in terms of going any farther. Let's get too far. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm told no. final question. Sarah. Can you tell us a little history about the Borak Museum? Ah, okay. Um, briefly, um, the Borak Museum existed in a townhouse. The townhouse was knocked down. Um, it was converted instead to the fabulous master building, which is one, which is an Art Deco building, the tallest on Riverside Drive. That then housed the Rorick Museum uh, for many years, um, and then Rorick uh, kind of fell out of favor and was kicked out by Louis Fort, who owned the space basically was the prime owner. And then at that point, the museum was moved around the corner from uh, the Shamaki National on the other side of the street. I'm told we can have one more. <laughs> this is a, <laughs> and I told a terribly there. specific question. There's a part of Riverside Drive um, in like the low 90s where it splits into a single yes. lane of northbound traffic right. from the Olmstead. Yes, it is. Why did they find that necessary to? Because of the, um, what's the word I want here? Great. Yeah, great, great, thank you. <laughs> um, it was very high and very wide there, and so it made more sense to have to build in the, the private road at that point. It really had all to do with the, the width and the grading. It's very steep. Well, Stephanie, thank you so okay. much for thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Research, fascinating, very eloquent presentation. I really you. appreciate it. Oh. Um, I want to call up Ann McDermott, who's going to introduce Frampton Tolbert of the Historic District Council, who's going to speak to us for a few minutes. Hi, everybody. So in addition to being a tour guide, I'm also uh, a fierce advocate for saving things in New York City, uh, sometimes very successfully and sometimes very unsuccessfully, uh, but that's uh, a heartbeat for me. And uh, through that process, I have been involved in various organizations, various groups, various coalitions of groups, and been on calls with New York State till through two o'clock in the morning to testify, please do not destroy that neighborhood. Uh, and one of the folks I met in that journey is Frampton Tolbert. And Frampton is the executive director for the Historic Districts Council. And I had the privilege a couple weeks ago of doing a uh, class for their members on how to be a tour guide in New York City. And it covered things like, you know, going to the website and filling out the form and, you know, how to write a tour, et cetera, et cetera. But um, HCC has some phenomenal resources if you, uh, for neighborhoods. So uh, without further ado, let me introduce Frampton to explain what HCC does. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Brandon Colbert, Executive Director of Historic District Council. I know some of you know us, but for those of you who don't know us, we are the citywide advocate for New York's historic neighborhoods. Um, we work on preservation issues with more than 500 community organizations across the city, um, working primarily on landmarking issues and neighborhood preservation of significant architectural, cultural, and historical buildings um, and districts. Uh, we do a lot of advocacy, as Anne said, a lot of campaigns. 
um, but we also have other things. We do a lot of educational programs. We have an annual conference, and we do a lot of walking tours and virtual tours where we hire organic guides um, for a lot of those programs. Um, one of our other major initiatives that we started about 10 years ago is called Six to Celebrate. So we choose six neighborhoods and community groups every year to work with on preservation priorities. So they apply to work with us. These are, and they're selected by a committee on our board. Um, this year's groups are Mojulu Parkway in the Bronx, um, the Garifuna Coalition in the Bronx, Kew Gardens, Steinway Village, and Addisley Park in Queens, and Bushwick in Brooklyn. Um, as part of that, they identify when they apply with us what their preservation priorities are, what kind of campaign they want to do, what types of buildings they want to preserve, um, but we also do other things with them. We do a walking tour, we do online programming, and we create walking tour guides with every organization where they identify the sites that they want to include in these walking tour guides. So these are our 2019 guides that just came out because of the pandemic, they were quite delayed. Um, but Hell's Kitchen, Chinatown, Little Italy, Kingsbridge, Dorrance Brook Square in Harlem, Bedford Park, and Hunts Point. Um, and these are all, the groups get 500 copies of these to distribute, but they're also free as PDFs on our website, so you will feel free to download them. And there are also now interactive walking tours on the Urban Archive um, platform. Um, and one of the reasons I talked to Anne, um, she did this great program for us, is we're trying to formalize more benefits for our Six to Celebrate groups. And I talked to Anne about a possible partnership with Gannon in that we wanted to formalize what we offer to our Six to Celebrate groups and hope that every year we could offer a program with a Gannon member about tour guides and how tours work, as well as offering a resource to these groups if they're interested to hire a Gannon member to help them develop tours for their own neighborhoods or give feedback. A lot of our groups, including two this year in Addis Lake Park and Queens um, and the Garifuna Coalition in the Bronx, um, want to develop their own tour programs. They want to have tour programs that they lead as community members rather than having student groups or other people come into their neighborhoods and do tours, which they say are great, but they don't talk to residents, they don't know all the history, and they would love to give their own tour programs and market their own tour programs, and they want to know how to do that. So ideally, we would offer, starting next year, a formal benefit as a six celebrate group that we would pay for them to hire a GANIC member, either geographically based or topic based, however they wanted, to help them develop a tour, formalize a tour, understand how these things work, how marketing works, and that sort of thing. Um, so that would be something that we would offer starting next year in a formal partnership with GAN. Um, and uh, that's all I have to say. Happy to take questions. Yes? I just have to say, I'm a quiet fan of HTC. I've taken the real estate course for preservation. That was, do you know what I mean? That was during the pandemic, realtors couldn't go. They got certified. I didn't, I didn't care. I learned so much about architecture. When I first started, the realtors or anybody, I ordered some of the six for that year, and I used them. That's what I practiced for walking tours in neighborhoods. You guys are amazing. I have to do my membership. So, do you work with the Landmark Commission? So, we actually see ourselves as a watchdog to the Landmark Commission. So, we actually are the only citywide group. We review every public proposal that comes before Landmarks. So, we review about 300 proposals for Landmarks buildings every year, and we testify on about 30 to 40 percent of those. So, we are at the Landmarks Commission almost every Tuesday, testifying on changes to Landmark buildings. Huh. Are you, sorry, I assume you all are responsible for the Brown Street signs? We are not. The Landmarks Commission uh, has a foundation that actually used to pay for those. They no longer do. So now when a neighborhood gets landmarked, they have to give their council member to pay for those street signs. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, but they are through the city, the state, you have to get them fabricated through DOT with funds from the city council member. Yes? Yes, I just wanted to know A, if you had a card, and B, if you have uh, two guys, one the Garifuna and the Addisley Park. Yeah. So there's our groups this year, so we'll be working with them on developing those years. So their guys won't come out until the beginning of next year. But what I told Ann is that um, Jose, our main contact for the Garifuna Coalition, came to Ann's program, and because of that, got very excited, is now, is now planning to become a licensed New York City tour guide and develop tours for his own community in the South Bronx looking at telling his story and telling the story of the neighborhood. Any 
Thank you. What's your website? Um, hdc.org. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if the membership needs to vote on this, but we <coughs> this is just our proposal for and for the for the organization to consider um, in the future. And if people have not checked out that urban archive interface, that's fantastic. And it'll be a great way to be able to access a lot of that information. Uh, we're going to do committee reports. Before we do committee reports, I just want to make sure that we don't have any new business to address at the end of the meeting. Does anybody have new business for the end of the meeting? Oh, wonderful. <laughs> uh, Long distance. <laughs> you can hear me right yeah. Yeah. so uh, education is one of those long we've been around for a long long time I mean Gannett's gonna be 50 years old and uh, I think didn't you start committees um, uh, tell me I know well anyway so we have committees now we're sort of the arms and the legs of the board so education uh, we have uh, we, we have meetings uh, one, usually once a month uh, as needed uh, this month we had a lot of things going on so we didn't but, um, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm challenged, but <laughs> so anyway, we, we have, uh, if you want, if you're interested in uh, developing a FAM tour, we do have a link you can click on, uh, and, uh, uh, but I, we usually start with, um, thank you for the most recent FAM tours, and Bob Gelber, who's on two committee, uh, more than two, um, <laughs> he's a, a one-man show. It, it, it's one, one, wonderful about this organization. It's like a relay, relay team, and it, you know, you pass the ball to someone, and Bob has been carrying the ball, <laughs> really, uh, and Susan, and Jeremy, and, and John Semlack, and uh, um, Elisa Minna Sharp, the, those are some of the people on, on the education committee. Eileen Rock and Newby. Uh, I think I mentioned everyone. But anyway, so uh, thank you to Susan and Bob for the guest speakers <coughs> and uh, the, uh, organizing this wonderful venue with industry relations, education, we work, work together. And the Carnegie Hall, thank you for the 19th and the 23rd, we went to Carnegie Hall. And the fam tour, a wonderful fam tour, the longtime emeritus Andrea Coyle, I always sing her praises. We, uh, we went to the, it was an encore, I'm so glad I got a chance to go. The Italian enclave in Williamsburg, a journey through the old neighborhood. Andrea specializes in uh, you know, small businesses in the neighborhoods that support them. So if you see your name on everything, jump. Now, uh, <laughs> Uh, we had a webinar, Omni, the MTA's new con con contactless pay system that should be accessible on our website now, so if you missed it, that's what's so wonderful about all these uh, webinars. You can just, if you're a GANIC member, you can, you can be uh, in Italy and just <laughs> look at a webinar <laughs> about Omni. I mean, so it's great. And uh, coming up, so this is the, the stuff coming up in, um, July, boy, we have like every, almost every day. Uh, July 6th uh, was Victorian Flatbush, that, that, that happened today with Jeremy, uh, expert, lives in the neighborhood, it's amazing. I've yes, taken this tour, this was an encore. And then Patrick Brinley, our author of the wonderful Metropolitan Museum book, he's done now a tour of Whitney, Whitman, <laughs> at Melville, Melville's New York, and that happened today. I hope a lot of people came at all times. Excellent. Fantastic. He is amazing. You have to read York this book Island. on the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, it, it, and he uh, uh, did, uh, did several tours of that last summer. And uh, we have a PDP, uh, a Macy Stylist Speaks to Gannick members, a panel of Macy Stylist. You know that if you have clients, uh, Macy's offers this to shop, you know, professional shoppers. And uh, Kit 
Garrett, you know, who's always dressed to the nines and wants <laughs> everyone else to be, uh, organize this. And so take advantage. It's not that long. It's from 2 to 2.30. I could use some advice, I'm sure. Uh, I'm from the East Village, so wearing a suit was no-no. Uh, but um, uh, then we have Bob Gelber. This is all Bob Gelber. Let's give him a hand. Where's Bob Gelber? Yeah. Okay, he's helping the ball this, this month. So it's 1 Willoughby Square, uh, which is an ar ar architecture in, in Brooklyn. Uh, and uh, 50 Years of Hip Hop, the Queen's Public Library, United Nations Family Architecture Tour, uh, United Nations Family Art Tour, and the, the dates are, uh, one, Willoughby Square is the 10th, uh, the 15th is the Hip Hop Queen's Public Library, July 18th, United Nations Family Architecture, July 20th, United Nations Family Art Tour, July 20th, Gannick at uh, uh, 5.30 to 9.30. You can do two tours in a day. You can do the United Nations Fam Art Tour at 1.15, and then from 5.30 to 9.30, you can do the Gannick Fam of Little Island and see the sunset, so that sounds nice. And then the United Nations Fam Garden Tour on the 24th, and the Edge, I'm going to that. Uh, breakfast and private access. Oh, breakfast. How could you resist? Uh, breakfast and private access for Gannic members. So, um, as I say, we have a virtual library of past fans it, uh, and the Omni, and I think Kits is going to be on there. And our next meeting is the third. Uh, it should be the third Wednesday of every month. And if you're new, just pop in at 6 p.m. You know, it's a short meeting uh, from 6 to 6:30 for newbies. And for uh, then we uh, we have a core of people now. Washington D.C. has two people. We because we're in New York City, we have eight members doing all kinds of organizing. So uh, okay, that's it. Patrick Casey for government relations, please. So subdued an introduction, Jonathan. You don't, you don't love me anymore. <laughs> I'll give you a good outro. You're on, you're on Christine McRae, the Clarion. <laughs> okay, hi everybody, how are you? Hi, Patrick. Okay, updates. We sent a couple of folks to Washington back in the spring, destination Capitol Hill. This is an industry focused, a tourism industry focused lobbying effort. Matt Baker and Kit Garrett attended. I'd like to inform you that one of the items that they uh, were lobbying for has cleared its first significant legislative hurdle. Uh, this year, uh, last month, the uh, House Appropriations Committee voted on the bill to fund the Department of Homeland Security, which contained a provision exempting returning H-2B workers who had previously worked in the United States within the last three years uh, from the annual H-2B visa cap next year. And what this measure significantly does is it increases the number of guest workers that can temporarily come in through the program and follows months of engagement and advocacy activities from U.S. travel and GANIC and all our members. Now this matters <coughs> because tourism is still lagging. We see it exploding but it's still lagging. It's still not up to its pre-pandemic levels. There are enormous job openings, and we all know that a robust tourism infrastructure can accommodate more guests. More guests means more money, more, money. more tour guides. <laughs> so this is a big one. Go back to the money. <laughs> this has cleared the Appropriations Committee. The House has got to mark it up. And depending on who's throwing a temper tantrum in the house this week, it's going to take a while. But guess what? You all have representatives in the house, right? So it always goes back to, you're, they're in office because you vote for them. You vote for them, why? Because they represent your interests. Tell your representatives in the most polite tour guide way possible, to stop bickering, stop acting like infants, and take care of business, our business. We need to get this moving forward. We are rebuilding the tourism industry. Another item that has made some progress, Initiative 1009. Now that is a city council initiative that will put 
tour guides back on the double decker buses. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Sponsored this time around by Gail Brewer. It has already picked up five sponsors within the Consumer and Worker Protection Committee. A simple majority is all, is all that is needed for that to pass out of committee to a public hearing to a council vote. We've already got the simple majority. Now that doesn't mean you should stop writing your council members. We can always use more sponsors. It makes it easier and faster for this bill to progress. But our big deal right now is to get on the agenda so that the council, the uh, committee within the council discusses it. We're not on it yet. So writing, we need you to write. Please write your council members. You want to see this um, move forward. You want to get the guides back on the buses. There was a lot of chatter, apparently big buses using, they're not calling them guides, they're entertainers, they're up on the double deckers. We got to put an end to this as quickly <coughs> as possible. So let me just inform you, if you are in uh, <coughs> districts represented by council members, Ose, Menin, Juan, or Abru, they've done nothing. Menon has actually said she will make her decision based on the committee's uh, discussion of the initiative. But that's it. Let's press on those that have not signed up yet as sponsors. We want this to pass. We need this to pass out of committee. We need it to get to a public hearing and to a vote. And this has gone on for a lot of years. Let's try to wrap it up within the next I'd love to say, within a year. This stuff sunsets. If we don't get it done, at the end of the legislative cycle, in a year and a half, we start all over. And I'm not going to be doing it. <laughs> and one more item, following up on the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, we're going to be reaching out through the Department of Transportation, through the Government Relations Committee, the Department of Trevor Department of Transportation has the jurisdiction over the Brooklyn Bridge. That is Commissioner Donis Rodriguez, who was the original uh, sponsor of 289A, the previous tour guide bill. So we have every intention of leaning into him on that. And Harvey is writing point on this project, this aspect of it. Deputy Mayor Banks is leading the task force created by Mayor Adams' office to address safety problems as they affect tourism. So it's very specific and very targeted, and Harvey's working on that one, so we hope to get them from both sides. But again, let your councilman know what's going on. They don't see this stuff. They're not walking the Brooklyn Bridge. I'll take questions in a minute. They're not walking the Brooklyn Bridge. If you're not bringing this to their attention, they honestly don't know about it, or if they know about it, they don't think it's a big deal because nobody's complaining about it. Much the same way as we are, are encouraging passage of 1009 from a public safety point of view, that's how we're going to approach the Brooklyn Bridge situation. To run around and say guides are no longer giving tours of the Brooklyn Bridge because of problems there, the immediate response is, well, vendors have a right to make a living too. So we're not going to let them put working people against each other. We're talking about a safe way that everybody, pedestrians, tourists, vendors, can all be taken care of. So the pitch on this one is safety. It's a public safety issue. So now I'll take questions. And Jeremy, you raise your hand up. Oh, oh by the way, Jeremy, thank you for your video, yes. which is traveling. Mm -hmm. And Stan O'Connor, if you're in the Ethernet or uh, watching us online, thank you for your photographs. Jeremy, any questions? Oh, you just made the point I was going to make. I had seen one member on social media tweeting at the city being like, oh, this is affecting tour, job, tour guides' jobs. I, as everyone in this room probably knows, the New York City government could not care any more or less about tour guide jobs than they do any other jobs. That's just, I'm not, that just is what it is. So if you make this about tour guide, how this is affecting our tours, as Patrick said, at that point, you're pitting different groups of people against each other, and they're going to stay out of it. It's a, the, the pitch is, when you, if you're going to tweet at people or, or post on this, it's a public 
safety issue. It's a safety hazard on the bridge. That's, that's the pitch. And, right. and that's it. Thank you. Can you just reiterate what the bills are so we know what to say when we call our representatives? Okay, right now regarding the Brooklyn Bridge, there's no bill. Okay. We're just talking about a public safety <coughs> issue has okay. developed on the bridge. Okay. Now, the bill for the tour guides on the double decker buses, that is 1009. The original sponsor of this go around is Gail Brewer, and a great person to target in your emails is the chairperson of the Council Committee for Worker and Consumer Protection, and that is Velasquez, Carolyn Velasquez out of the Bronx. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, more, Cindy. Two things. One is, this is the time of year a lot of the council members are out there. Introduce yourselves as a licensed tour guide. If you see Gail Brewer anywhere, thank her. She really does love tour guides. She's proven that, she said it in the past, personally to me many times. The other thing is, when you talk about the bridge, frankly, try getting some of the preservation groups too. Because when you go up, I don't stand, if I know the people know English, the tourists, I hold their stuff on one side of the bridge, explain to them, I can't show them the historic names and stuff because they have hot dogs there or whatever. <laughs> So this is a big disrespectful preservation issue. It's not just safety for tour guides and tourists. But that's another way to hit it too. That's a great viewpoint. Anybody else? Okay. Yes, in the back? Uh, yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the Brooklyn Bridge is a national landmark. Yes. Could you there be a federal intervention on this? Can there? Good question. <laughs> Guess what you just got? <laughs> you got an assignment. <laughs> Be very careful about what you suggest somebody else should do it. <laughs> no, thank you. It's a great idea. And if you can pursue it, that'd be wonderful. The government relations is a small, well-meaning, but small group of people. So we can always use a little extra muscle in there. Somebody else in the back, yes? A uh, question on the double-decker buses. Who are the five other council members that were supporting it so far? Oh, the five that are doing it now? Yes. Uh, and of course, I put that down for uh, the uh, four that haven't. Uh, obviously, Velasquez, uh, Brewer, uh, Farias, Krishnan, and not Mena, no, and uh, Botcher. You know like how huge it is getting Botcher? He was Corey Johnson's chief of staff, who loved 289A until he didn't. <laughs> and wouldn't tell us why. He just ghosted us. So getting bunch was huge. And I know a lot of you had a lot to do with emailing into that. Yes? Hi, is there any update on reducing the visa time for people traveling from India as well as Brazil to New York? I know, or the United States for that matter. I know that was the subject about two or three months ago came up. If a certain party could stop blocking appointments, we could start staffing the State Department, and that could be addressed. That's the big issue right now. State is actually overwhelmed right now. They can't do it. They don't have the manpower. Passport backlogs. Basically, visa yeah. Backlogs. They don't have the personnel to move the visa requests. And as Jonathan just said, our own American passports are jammed up as well. Yeah. What if the sentiment by our, by our Everybody wants it dealt with. Everyone wants it cleaned up, but nobody's taking the action to do it because of partisan politics. Right. Any updates on the uh, Ellis Island and the status of support guides? Okay, regarding Statue uh, of Liberty, Ellis Island, uh, the uh, Government Relations Committee has reached out to the membership to please supply us with your stories and dates and be as specific as possible so we can assemble a package and exploit an opportunity we have to perhaps meet with Representative Goldman's office. They are open to talking with us, but I've only gotten two emails from Gannick members about what's going on on Statue of Liberty in Ellis Island. I can't go into a representative's <coughs> office with two stories. It's just not enough. If you've got a story about something that happened to you or that you witnessed, 
on Ellis Island or, or Liberty Island, send it to us, governmentrelationsorganic.org. We need to build the arsenal. Right now, it just ain't there. I, I can't blow that kind of political capital. Yes? May you remind us what the site issue is at Capture Liberty is now planning? I think we're gonna do that offline at the end of the meeting just because we are running up against running late. Um, one last question then. I live in Ms. Juan's district. I live in 11104, my zip code. Is it possible to use uh, Jeremy's uh, email about the congestion? Uh, was it Jeremy's email about the congestion on the Brooklyn Bridge? Has there been video is on our website, is it not? Uh, I believe so. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll. Um, is uh, it possible to forward that? Yeah, I could. I could ask for like a, a brief informational interview as a constituent to this line. Sure, I'll follow up with you about that. And I could use that as an email and introduction. Why yeah. I'm on her time. Pictures yeah. are worth a thousand words. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Keep writing. <laughs> Are you going to be upset if I don't give you a big announcement? <laughs> Bob, come on up. Uh, Industry Relations, Bob Gilbert. Um, before I give my report, just want to mention again that Stephanie's books are back there. Please buy them so she doesn't have to carry them. <laughs> okay, so um, Harvey has already been mentioned several times this evening. And um, speak up. I can't, because <laughs> my allergies. Um, Harvey did meet someone at New York City Tourism and Convention, and he connected, as they've all been mentioning, with Philip Banks, who is the Deputy Mayor for Public Safety. Harvey has been writing him back and forth. Harvey is traveling between his grandchildren right now in Pittsburgh and Chicago. And every morning I get emails from Harvey. <laughs> so Harvey is a force. And if anything can be done, and Jeremy's video was sent out by Harvey to the deputy mayor's office. So hopefully we'll get results there. With, um, with an apology for some of my adult language. Oh, <laughs> we love adult language. This is yeah. New York City. My New York, my New York language. Harvey <laughs> has also attracted through many of these New York City tourism and convention meetings uh, new industry partners to fill out applications. Shake, Rowan, Roll, Dueling Pianos is now an industry partner. Jeremy, did we get a vote yet on Amadeo Travel Solutions? Yes, were they were approved. Oh, excellent. So we have two. And we will also be sending out uh, a vote for Food on Foot New York City Tours. We're no longer going to be doing the vote at the monthly meetings. Instead, we'll be doing them, as Jeremy had said, 14 days after the application, and we're doing it online. So. Uh, what I really just wanted to mention is that we are set uh, through and into part of the new year wow. in venues. And all of them, except for one, are free. Congratulations, which is uh, very important to us. So in August, courtesy of Susan Birnbaum, we will be at Wave Hill in the Bronx. September, we're going back to the Montauk Club since we couldn't do it on the Canadian Orange Day. <laughs> uh, October, we will be at the Elizabeth Foundation for the Arts, who sponsored a fam several months ago for us. We'll be back there. November, we will be at the Center at Park West Presbyterian Church. December, we should be at Old St. Patrick's in Nolita. January, the Hard Rock Cafe in Times Square. And that is courtesy of Jeff Klein. If any of you remember, Jeff Klein used to be the manager at Luna Park. And technically, this is July. We should be at Luna Park tonight. But Jeff is no longer here. So we're lucky enough to be here as guests. Uh, he has invited us for that meeting in January at the Hard Rock. February, uh, we will be at the Society of Illustrators on East 63rd Street, and uh, we are working on something for March right now, and then we'll continue with the rest of the year. Now, one little thing I just want to mention. 
because uh, I have kind of been on a roll. I haven't slept that much this month. Um, we have been invited <coughs> to an awful lot of places for fam trips. And in some instances, there are not a lot of people who have registered, which is not the intent. We try to fill them up. When we're invited and we're allowed 20 people, we hope we get either the 20 or even a wait list for it. But um, the reason why there were so many is because organizations approached me and they gave us these dates, and I never like to say no. So that's why Carnegie Hall came to me with two dates. The United Nations came back, you know, earlier this year we were at the UN three times, we're going back three times. Some of the numbers are low, but hopefully in the next 15 days, three weeks when they take place, they will be better. Little Island was amazing because they approached us because we gave them an Apple Award at our event this year, and they didn't want to lose the connection. So we have two events at Little Island. One of them has decent registration, almost 20 people. The next day we only have about six or seven, so I'm hoping that it will fill up. <clears throat> and then the last one I want to mention is courtesy of Rosalind Spitzner. <coughs> Mm -hmm. Gannick member who connected us with Ralph McDaniels. Anyone who doesn't know who Ralph McDaniels is, he's pioneering TV host and hip hop historian. He also is on the advisory board of the Hip Hop Museum that will be opening in the Bronx within the next few months. Ralph has invited us to an exhibit that he curated at the central branch of the Queens Public Library. It is next Thursday, July 13th. He has invited us to come with 25 people. Right now, there are only four of us registered. So hopefully, some of you sitting here that did not know about it will be able to register. Yes, Rita? Um, is it possible to try to make the uh, fan tours in the afternoon? Because most of us, most of the tours are in the morning. Well, the thing is, that's when we get invited. I know. And I try to make arrangements, but I can't twist arms all the time. But Little but Island, we have a 5.30 yes, invite, okay. and then the next day. I really cannot, you know, a place isn't gonna stay open for us if they close at a certain hour. So we try our best, and we do try to do evening events. They don't work out, because most places close. But um, look at the list, and hopefully, let's fill them up as best we can. Yes, Cindy. You mentioned, I missed a few meetings, maybe I missed it, but NYC and Company, is yes. that name? Based it's the out? new name, they've been rebranded. They are now New York City Tourism and Conventions. Okay, so, oh, yes. Okay. Yes. okay, therefore, at some point, and Jeremy, I'm sorry, I think it should be removed, I noticed it on the brochure. The name NYC and Company. Yeah, we, we'll, we'll make the changes. Okay, um, most people easier. still refer to it as NYC and Company. Right. It's right. It's right. Easier. Right. And, right. and right. they're realizing that because they yeah. only rebranded it at their annual convention right. like two months ago. John, quick question. Can we just give Bob a round of applause? Yeah. <laughs> about next month's meeting, it is also a Thursday meeting, correct? Yes, it is. Also it's a Thursday, a Thursday meeting. meeting. Oh. The reason why they are changed, we're here tonight because this is their open night. If we wanted to come uh. last night, it would have been about $10,000. <laughs> you weigh and measure, same thing at Wave Hill, that's sure. their night. Sure. And at Wave Hill, the shuttle bus will be there for us at 8 o'clock. So. What the, be I'm sorry, the best way to get to Wave Hill is to go on Metro North, and you'll be there in 20 minutes, oh, 25 God. minutes. And we're going to get early access as well, correct? Yes. Yeah, 4 o'clock. There we go. Very cool. Things just keep getting better for us. 
One last committee report. It's going to be Ann McDermott for membership. So the next one we're going to organize uh, is going to be at the South Street Seaport, oh, wow. at the southeast corner of the South Street Seaport, and it is a BYOB party. Uh -huh. So whatever you like to eat or drink or whatever, there's a little corner there with a view of the harbor, and it's got seating and benches and um, just the hangout, basically. You know, like you used to do when you worked in an office and you got together with your friends after work and you went to the seaport and just hung out? That's what we're going to do. And, you know, get to know each other. Uh, bring a friend. What's bring another. The, uh, the 27th of July. Oh. Jeremy will send out um, an invite tomorrow. An tomorrow. invite tomorrow. I, I took a couple of photographs. So, along those lines, I was actually down there because I uh, saw the posting in um, the Gannett Facebook group that Mel Wasserman did about the historic parade in uh, Lower Manhattan on July 4th. Wow. And it was a blast. Literally. It was so much fun. There's a, the Lower Manhattan Historical Association organizes this. And it's basically an acknowledgement of the fact that, hey, this is where it happened. Mm -hmm. New York was the first place the Declaration of Independence was run, was, was, was read. And we marched. We had a bagpipe band in the back and a drum band uh, in the front and a, bag, and a drum band in the back. And they were both phenomenal. It was just a great way to spend the 4th of July walking through the streets of Lower Manhattan and remembering that this is where the history happened. Um, so next year, I recommend you mark your calendar and come to that event because it was, it was really, really fun and thanks to Mel for uh, posting about it. Um, so bring a friend to that party. Uh, so if you're new, if you're a new guy, if you're new to Gannick, within the last, say, two years, stand up. Well, those of you who are older guides, or been guides, or veteran guides, veteran, veteran guides, guides, and, uh, veteran guides uh, just you know, introduce yourself, chat, whatever. It's a sh it's all about the sharing of the information and the sharing of the knowledge about how to be a guide. We have six brand new members this month, so our membership is we're, we're averaging between five and six members per month now. And uh, I just want to say we have a little bit of uh, Gannick swag over there <coughs> if you don't, you know, a, a lanyard and whatever. But if you would like to have like a shirt that says Gannick or, or a jacket that says Gannick, which Harvey uh, often wears, uh, I can send you the link <laughs> for Land's End. Because, you know, branding is a big part of being a guide, right? You want to come across as a certain, certain thing. And if you don't have your own individual branding, it's good to sort of know that you could get yourself a Gannick shirt or a Gannick thing, and people would know, well, who's that person, and what's that logo, you know? You're not like those guys at the Statue of Liberty trying to get people to pay for the Staten Island Ferry. <laughs> um, and if I could just ask, if, uh, if everybody, if you, when you check, you make sure to check in for the meeting, especially if you're a new member, because part of becoming a new member is we have to go through the database and check that you attended, was it four mm -hmm. meetings, Jeremy? Yeah, mm -hmm. four meetings, so, yeah. so that's a good thing. And uh, so come to the party, that's it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, I just have two things to remind you about before we adjourn, and I'm gonna do this within a minute so that we are on our schedule. Um, number one is that Susan is giving Amazon.com a run for its money and is going to try to single-handedly sell all of Stephanie's books. Um, it's Prime Day for Stephanie's books. Um, it's thirty nine ninety five. So Stephanie's going to be over there, perhaps even signing some of the books. I'd be happy to. Um, I just wanted to remind people that coming up this fall, we are going to be having our board elections. And I wanted to encourage you to consider whether you might uh, want to serve Gannick in a board role. There are going to be some vacancies. 
And so I want to start the ball rolling and remind people that uh, GANIC only is here because of the volunteers who run GANIC. Nobody here is getting paid, uh, and the board has a lot of responsibilities. Um, but it is also a lot of fun, and it's wonderful to feel uh, as if you are of service to GANIC by joining the board. So I do want to encourage people to begin thinking about that and begin asking board members what the different roles and responsibilities are if they're curious. You all seem to be shuffling and rustling in your seats as if the mere suggestion of joining the board is making you all <laughs> My goodness. Uh, I move to adjourn. Second. Second. There we go. We are adjourned.